Our reading this morning is taken from Genesis chapter 2, and we are reading from verse 4 until verse 25. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four head waters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic, resin, and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Jihon. Jihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man from the you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air, he brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Amen. Thank you, Delan. Good to have you all, uh, especially if you are visiting us this morning. It is wonderful to have you. Um, and as Bev mentioned, uh, please join us for morning tea so we can um, get to know you a bit more. And if you haven't met me before, my name is Dilan Jasinghe. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'd love to have a chat with you um, over morning tea. If you are here for the first time, uh, we have just started a sermon series uh, going back to the beginning, uh, to the book of Genesis, to think about our backstory, our origin story. So um, we are at chapter 2 today. So before we go any further, allow me to lead us in a short prayer. Father God, we, we thank you for the awesome privilege of uh, being here under your feet, and especially being under your word. And Father, uh, we commit ourselves to your hands, me as a speaker and everyone else listening. And Lord, may your spirit be at work that we may 
not be just people who are just learning, but Father, being shaped by your word. And we ask this for your glory, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As, as I mentioned, Genesis um, gives us the backstory, backstory of our existence. It gives us the backstory of, of the universe, life on earth, marriage, family, community, the backstory of why Jesus had to come and die on a cross. In Genesis 1, if you weren't here last week, uh, we were introduced to the God who is behind this backstory. The eternal creator, universal good God who invites us into a relationship with him. Now, I wonder whether this has happened to you, whether you have done this. You go somewhere to have a meal, and then you, you come across this great dish, and you just gobble it, and you, you, just, you just enjoy it, because it is so delicious. And you go for your seconds and the thirds, and, and you even ask the host to give you a doggy bag to take home to eat later. And, and then you, you turn to your host, and you ask, like, what is that? What, what did you, how did you make that? I mean, that is so good. It is so delicious. Tell me the ingredients that you use. Tell me, tell me how you made it. Tell me the recipe. And then the, the host sits around and she, she or he uh, tells you how they made this dish. Why it is so good. Well, I guess when we look at Genesis chapter 2, this is kind of what is happening. In Genesis 1, on the, on the sixth day, when God created everything, he looked at everything, and, and he said, this is so good. This is very good. This is beautiful, perfect. And in Genesis chapter 2, we are told why. Why it was so very good. Genesis chapter 2 is kind of a, a rewind to day 6. And it zooms in on the pinnacle of God's creation, man and woman. In Genesis chapter 2, we meet the humans. We meet the humans. But before we get, get to that, notice how the name of God changes from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 2. Look at Genesis chapter 1. It is God. God Elohim. We, we hear about him. God. The cosmic almighty God who, who flung the stars into the sky, who created the whole universe. But here in Genesis chapter 2, if you read, you are introduced to Lord God. Yahweh Elohim. He's the relational, personal, covenant God. In a sense, the writer is kind of telling us, you know, the God who created the whole universe, the God Almighty, is also a personal, relational, intimate God. The God of the universe is also our Heavenly Father. So this morning, what I want to think about is, what does it mean to be human according to our Heavenly Father? What does it mean to be human according to our Heavenly Father? Again, like Genesis chapter 1, there's a lot of information which I don't have the time to go through this morning. But I want just to pick up five aspects of humanity from this passage. Five aspects of humanity from this passage. So if you have your Bibles, keep it open. Some of the verses will come up, but not everything. But it'll be good to have your Bibles open in front of you. And also there's an outline if you want to take notes. First to be humans is to have the life of God, isn't it? The breath of God. Now, I think many of you have seen Harry Potter, right? But not many of us have seen a clay potter, right? A man who sits 
around a wheel, and, and as, he, as he turns, he takes a, a, a lump of clay, and then he, he designs something. He designs uh, an object as the wheel turns. He gets his hands dirty as he fashions and, and shapes this object. And here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that's the picture I get of God. He's getting his hands dirty as he takes this, this lump of clay, shaping and, and fashioning the first man and woman according to his eternal plan, putting, his, putting the man's, man, man's hand and feet together, uh, deciding the face with, with the eyes and nose and mouth and ears, and, and working out the, the complete complex set of DNA that we have. If you, if you remember Psalm 139, uh, God is described as a weaver or, or, or a knitter who weaves us in and knits us in our mother's womb. You see, humans, you and me, are not an accident. We are not an afterthought of God. We are an intentional, purposeful creation. The human body is good. But then just like every other animal that God created, we humans are created out of dust, aren't we? We are frail. But then we are also different. Because verse 7 continues. God did something that he, did, he hadn't done with the animals. He breathes into uh, to the nostrils of the man. And the man became... A living being. Just think about the action of breathing. It's, it's warm. It is, it is personal. It is intimate, isn't it? What makes us tick? What makes us connected to God? What makes us going is God has breathed his life onto us. We are living beings. So if we owe our existence to God, then it matters, isn't it, how we live our lives every day. It matters to God that we appreciate the bodies that God has given, whatever shape or color it is. It matters to God that we eat good fruit or food and, and exercise and look after our bodies without abusing it with harmful substances. It matters to God that we take steps to, to rest and, and restore our bodies when, when they are broken. Because we have been given the breath of God. We have the life of God in us. And the secondly, to, to be human is to bear the image of God. The image of God. Now, going back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God says, Let us make man in our image, in our likenessness. Now, you might say, Hang on, there's this. We thought there's only one God there. I mean, who is, who is he talking to? Do Christians believe like many gods? A valid question. Now, here we have the very first occasion in the Bible where the most complex idea or the teaching or the doctrine of the Trinity mentioned in the Bible. It is a hard to explain concept. People have tried to explain what this trinity is, but this diagram might help us a little bit. Where we see God is one but three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, existing eternally together. They're of the same essence or, or the nature, but they're three distinct persons 
The best example that we can see in the Bible is when Jesus was being baptized. You see, you see Jesus in the water. You see the Holy Spirit coming down as a dove. And then you hear the voice of the Heavenly Father from the sky. We can call each one God, but they are addressed as one. In Deuteronomy 6, the people are told, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Do you see why I said it is complex? The Bible doesn't try to explain this. But as you read the Bible, God is presented as a trinity. Now that we've opened that can of worms, let's go to the next one. The Trinity consulted together when, when God created man. And he said, let us create man in our own image. Let us create man in our own image and likeness. Notice both man and woman were created in his likeness, in his image. They have different roles, but... They have equal standing before God, before each other. But what does it mean to be created in the image and the likeness of God? Does it mean that we look like God in appearance? Now, I want to suggest it, it's much more than having the appearance of God. Think about an image. If I show you this picture, you will you definitely realize, where is this? This is the opera house. This is not the exact opera house. This is just an image of the opera house. But it brings you all the memories of maybe times that you've been there, how it looked like, how you felt inside, how the sound was, what it, what it meant to stand in front of it and take a photo. We are reminders of who God is, his character. We are the image of God. Now think about likeness. Perhaps people have come to you and said, you know what, you look exactly like your father or, or your mother, like father, like son, or like mother, like daughter. They don't just mean that, that your chin or your eyes look like your, your parents. But your, your mannerism, your character, your, your stubbornness perhaps, the kindness, your qualities, it reminds them of your parents. So when God created humans in his image and likeness, in each one of us he has put his nature, his character, his, his qualities, so we reveal God to us. For example, when we show kindness or creativity, when we care for the creation around us, when we restore something, when we love an enemy or feed the hungry, when we forgive and bring peace to a situation, when we act like our heavenly Father, we remind those around us who God is. We reveal who God is and what He is like. We, each one of us, has the image of God placed in us. If we human beings are created in the image and the likeness of God, friends, there is no room for discrimination, right? No room for discrimination uh, based on ethnicity or, or race or gender or age or religion. There's no room for domestic violence. There's no room for jealousy or pride. And because every human being is created in the image and the likeness of God, we, all, we have all the reasons to love and forgive one another. We have all the reasons to treat everyone with respect and dignity. We have all the reasons to care for the poor, the fatherless, the widow, the orphan, the refugee, the disabled, the young, the old, and the dying. And most importantly, this is the 
the fundamental, the most important reason why we should share the gospel with anyone and everyone, regardless of who they are. And I quite like what people like Kel and Tony and Angelo and others who does with the prisoners, going and sharing the gospel. Why? Because, yes, they've got things wrong, but they still have the image of God in them. And they need Jesus, isn't it? We have the breath of God. We have the image of God in us. And thirdly, to be human is to live under the care of God. To live under the care of God. Have you noticed in these two chapters, God is at work. He's providing everything to humans, isn't he? As we just saw, he gives a body, an identity, and breath to humans. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 to 30, God provides food for his people. You see, the garden, or the uh, place to, to live, it's lush, isn't it? There's plenty of water. There's gold and, and precious stones. And did you notice the place was not only functional, it, it, didn't just, it didn't just have everything that man and woman needed to live, but it was also beautiful, isn't it? Now, have you noticed today there is this push to have green spaces in among concrete jungles? Because we now recognize we can't just live in a functional building. No, we need beauty around us. We need green spaces around us. God knew that. Verse 15 of chapter 2, God provides humans with meaningful, or he provided a garden, then he provides meaningful work to keep the garden. Verse 16, God gives freedom. So you can eat anything and everything in the garden. Verse 17, God provides proper boundaries, isn't it? He says you can eat anything and everything, but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In verses 18 to 25, God sees that loneliness is not good. So he provides a woman, a suitable companion for the man. You see, God is at work providing everything for the humans. Humans don't do anything. They don't contribute. Which means they have to trust. They have to trust in God. Now, that's what Jesus said, isn't it? Don't worry about tomorrow. What to eat, what to drink, what to wear. Because your Father knows that you need all this. Seek first the kingdom of God and and his righteousness and and all these things will be added to you. What is he saying? He's inviting us to trust in God to provide all our needs. He's saying God can provide. God will provide. That is what he's going to do. But trust in him. Pray. Bring all your petitions and concerns. He's saying God, the king of the universe, is able to provide all your needs. To be human, to be a human being is then to live under the care of God the Father, the king of the universe. That's why we pray, don't we? That's why we bring our petitions to God. We do our pastoral prayers. We pray for Turkey and Syria. We pray for Ukraine and we pray for Uganda. We pray for one another because we depend on God. God's care. Fourth, to be human being according to God is to live in relationship. Live in relationship. As we saw earlier, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit lives in a perfect relationship. So we, who have the image of God, have the capacity, have the ability also to live 
and relationship. In the garden, we see three relationships, don't we? First, humans live in relationship with God. Deuteronomy 6, 5, uh, when, when, when God speaks, he's, he, he says, well, I don't want your rituals, I don't want your religion. What does he say? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. He's not after our religion. He's not after us having a religion. He's after having a relationship. That is what Christianity is about, isn't it? Having a relationship with God. A relationship, a personal relationship with God. And second, God created human beings to have relationship with one another. We see in in verse 18, the first not good in the Bible. God looks at man and says, it is not good for man to be alone. Man was alone. So what does he do? What does God do? He creates another human being, a woman who fits or who is suitable to stand before man uh, opposite as his his counterpart, companion, to complement the man, And then God institutes marriage between one man and one woman for life as one way of dealing with man's loneliness. Because, friends, as we see the Bible, not everyone gets married. There are people who are single. Take, for an example, our Lord Jesus. And the Apostle Paul, as he descri- describes or discusses marriage, he says, marriage is not for everyone. It is not a gift for everyone. But relationship, friendship, mateship, companionship is. Because we need one another. God created us to have relationship with one another. If marriage is not a gift for us, we need to find friends, good friends. Be part of a community. Work with others. Play with others. Because we are created to be in relationship with one another. And the third thing is humans also are created to be in relationship with the creation. The way we relate to the rest of the creation is by caring and keeping it, isn't it? The humans are to rule over the fish, the birds, and every living creature that moves around the ground. And you see, in Genesis 2, 1 and 2, creation is in, in perfect harmony with humans, isn't it? To be in the image and the likeness of God then is to be in relationship with God, with one another, and with the rest of the creation. And when we come to the next, next chapter, we will see how all those three relationships were impacted by the four. Finally, to be human means to live according to the word of God. Now, where is the word of God in Genesis chapter 1 and 2? We don't have a Bible But the word of God is everywhere, isn't it? Creating, restoring, renewing, bringing order, uh, bringing order into chaos, bringing light into darkness. The word of God reveals who God is and his will. How we should live according to God in his world. Here in verses 16 and, and 17, God says, you are free to eat anything. But he also gives them a boundary, doesn't he? Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God also describes the consequences of crossing the boundary. You will surely die. The humans are, are not puppets or robots in God's hand. No, God gives them a choice. God gives us a will to choose, 
to live by his word. He gives us the free will to choose to obey or not. God's word tells us what is good and what is not. And we are given the ability to choose and live with the consequences. Now think about a goldfish in a fish tank. As long as the fish is inside the fish tank, it is safe. It can enjoy, it can run around, or swim around, it can thrive, it can live. But the moment it jumps out of the fish tank, it suffers. It can't live long outside the fish tank. The same with the humanity, isn't it? God has kept boundaries for our good, not to harm us, like the command not to steal, not to cheat, not to murder, like marriage is between one man and one woman for life, like sex is good inside marriage. But the moment we, we cross those boundaries, there is pain, there is chaos, there is darkness and disorder. And do you see how, how Genesis chapter 2 ends? I mean, we, we, we chuckle when you read the last verse. It says, Adam and his wife were both naked and they, were, they felt no shame. They were not ashamed. And this is what it means to live according to God's word, isn't it? It's not running around naked. There's no fear. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's no insecurity. Everything is at peace. There is satisfaction, contentment. Did I mention joy? There is joy. See, when, when God saw the human beings that he, he created in his own image and likeness, living by his breath, living under his care, living in relationship, living according to his word. Do you know what he said? Do you know what he said? He said, it is very good. He said, it is very beautiful. It is perfect. As I mentioned earlier, next Sunday we will see how this very good creation was marred by sin, but till then, we should take time to praise God for, for the life that we have, for the identity that we have, for the ability to live under his care, for the ability to live in relationship and the word of God that guides us. And if we think about it, this is what Jesus died to restore in us, isn't it? 2,000 years ago. This is the work of the Holy Spirit transforming us into the likeness of Jesus, who is the very image of God. And, and, and the Apostle Paul says, God, the, the Spirit of God is transforming us into the image and the likeness of Jesus from one degree to another. We are all in the process of being transformed being restored to our original image, the image that God has given us. So why don't we take a moment to just reflect and give thanks to God for, for who we are and, and praise God for that, and then I'll lead us in a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity for us to 
read through and, and get our minds around the creation, the creation of, of human beings in, in the Garden of Eden. Lord, we, we, we can't fathom how you brought us together. But we thank you for creating us in your image. Thank you for giving us your breath. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for the ability to have relationships. And thank you for the word of God that guides us. And thank you for Jesus. Because it is in him that we are being restored to what we've lost at the fall. Help us to practice whatever we've learned today. To be the image bearers, to have good relationships, to know how to live under your word. To know how to be your people in this world. And as we do, may you be honored and glorified. And we ask this for your glory. Amen.